since there's not any more, uh, get started this morning. As I mentioned in the adult class uh, sermon this morning, is going to be the parable of the talents, which just so happens that we opened with that in our uh, responsive reading. Um, the idea with the parable of the talents is that we're not supposed to bury our talents. We're supposed to work. We're supposed to identify what talent we have, what gift we have, and work with that for God's purposes. And we're just going to start by reading the first part of the parable of the talents in Matthew 25, verses 14 through 28. And yes, uh, we're going to be repeating a different version of what we read first thing this morning, but hopefully we can glean something out of this. For it is just like a man about to go on a journey who called his own slaves and entrusted his possessions to them. To one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, each according to his own ability. And he went on his journey. So a couple of things to pick up here. The talents that were given to these people were based on their own ability. The responsibility load that this man going on the journey, the entrusted responsibility he gave to his slaves or his servants or his workers or his people were based on their ability. He's the one that got to decide how much of that ability is granted. So us being the people that are the workers, it's really kind of a fruitless exercise if all we do is compare ourselves to other people and our abilities to other people's abilities. We're all going to be different. We're all going to have strengths and weaknesses with different things. Some of us will be good teachers. Some of us will be good cooks. Some of us will be terrible at both of those. Some of us will be profitable with our own money, monetary, wealth. And we can use all of these things as tools. These are gifts that God has given us. Everything that we have is something that is on loan from God. And it's our responsibility to be good stewards of them. So this man gives his servants, his slaves, according to their abilities. And then immediately, the one who had received the five talents went and traded with them and gained five more talents. In the same manner, the one that had received the two talents gained two more. But he who received the one talent went away and dug a hole in the ground and hid his master's money. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. When I was in my late 20s, I was installing satellite TV and installing theater systems for people uh, in their houses so that they could watch The Matrix. Primarily, that was the big movie at the time. And there was a man who had a beautiful home being built up in the plain area who was a couple years older than me. And I asked him, hey, what do you do for a living? Basically, how in the world does some 30-year-old guy afford this house? And he said, well, I had the choice when I was going to college to either go into technology or learn how to make money by investing other people's money. And that's what he chose. And he was very good at it. I just checked, about two years ago, I, I got on an app, app that I could invest a little bit of money in the stock market. I invested $250. Any guesses on what that money is worth today? Do you think it's worth more? Phil is right, it is not worth more. It's worth $113 today. I would not be very good <laughs> at doing what that guy did. But he obviously had that talent. Now, does that mean that I couldn't learn? No. But he identified what he wanted to do, and he became good at it. I was installing his home theater system. So as far as wealth building, he had me beat. So the, uh, the ability to identify what you're good at is going to be key for each one of us. 
And as Tony brought up at the end of the adult class, whoever wasn't in here, I'll, I'll explain it. Sometimes we aren't the best ones to identify what we're good at. Sometimes it takes other people to come up and say, hey, you did a great job at this. You should think about doing more of that. What's harder is sometimes someone coming up and saying, hey, you really didn't do a good job at this. Maybe you should think about doing something else. And that's really hard for both parties, the one hearing and the one saying. But that's where we should be able to adjust our compass and say, okay, I'm good at this because these people, my friends, my family, my family are telling me that I'm good at this. I should invest more of my time, more of my energy, more of my talent in this ability that God's given me. It's not an ability that I made myself. It's not something that I put on myself and decided I'm going to be good at this thing. But we should take that and hone it, cultivate it, and master it. Now, after a long time, the master of those slaves came and settled accounts with them. The one who had received the five talents came up and brought five more talents, saying, Master, you had entrusted five talents to me. See, I have gained five more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. And the one who had received the two talents came and said, Master, you entrusted two talents to me. See, I have gained two more talents. His master said to him, Well done, good and faithful slave. You were faithful with a few things. I will put you in charge of many things. Enter into the joy of your master. So the first two individuals here doubled their talent, doubled their investment, doubled their fruit. Because at the end of the day, that's what God's looking for. He's looking for good fruit. He's looking for good sons and daughters to join him in this kingdom. The last individual is then called up. The one also who had received the one talent came up and said, Master, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you did not sow and gathering where you scattered no seed. And I was afraid and went away and hid your talent in the ground. See, you have what is yours. But his master answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy slave, you knew that I reap where I did not sow and gather where I scattered no seed. Then you ought to have put my money in the bank, and on my arrival I would have received my money back with interest. Therefore take away the talent from him and give it to the one who has ten, the ten talents. So the one person who had one talent decided to not do anything with it. He decided that he was just going to sit on it. Are we doing the same thing with our talents? Do we have a talent that we could offer, that we could give back to God, and yet we just sit on it? Paul has some thoughts on this same topic in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 through 3. Verse 1, Therefore I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. So this idea, this uh, sometimes we get tripped up on this word sacrifice. It usually has a connotation of something dying. In this case, what it says is a living sacrifice. So what Paul's imploring, what, what Paul is urging is that we present our abilities, we present our talents, we work with the, the gifts that God has given to us to present a living sacrifice. We're supposed to dedicate those talents that we have, those abilities that we have, back to God as a spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, so that you may prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you, not to think more highly of himself 
than he ought to think. But to think so as to have sound judgment as God has allowed, allotted to each measure of faith. So in the parable, there were three individuals that got three different levels or different ability levels. We had the guy with five, two, and one. And like I mentioned, it's really fruitless if we just, if we're the guy with one or if we're the guy with two to say, well, woe is me because I don't have five. Or woe is me because I don't have ten. But remember what God says is that to whom much is given, much will be required. The guy that has the one talent, that's a God-given talent. The guy that has five talents, God decided he got five or she got five. And they're required to work all five of them. You're required to work with what God's given you. Comparing one another amongst ourselves is not going to be fruitful. It's a waste of time. Each one of us can take the talent, however many we have, and give it back to God. For just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith, if service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who extorts in his exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads with diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we got a lot of different buckets of things that Paul lists here as far as talents or abilities or gifts. A lot of those words are just interchangeable. So everybody's going to have different gifts. They're going to have different gifts according to how much grace was given to them how much responsibility God has placed on each individual. And all of us are to exercise them accordingly. The first one here is prophecy. He lists this, if prophecy according to the proportion of his faith. The word prophecy, my mind typically jumps to some, someone foretelling the future. Someone saying, this thing's going to happen. But well, really, what this is saying is someone that is saying the words of God. The prophets were repeating what God told them. No man has the ability to foretell the future. Even the men that God used as mouthpieces, they did not get that of their own power. Jesus did not have the power to tell the future without God allowing that to happen. But the gift here, this prophecy, is talking about the ability to say God's words, to convey God's messages, to spread His word in a way that others can learn and hear. Other way around, hear and then learn. There are people that can do this. And there are people that would not do this well, whether it's because they have stage fright whether it's because they don't speak the same language or aren't confident in their ability to speak the language. Whatever the, the reason is, some people have the gift of prophecy. Some people have the gift to be able to teach the Word of God. Some people have the gift of service. There's a lot of people in this room that have never stepped foot up here, but they're able to give in other ways. They're, they're able to do work, works of service. And we're supposed to, if that's our talent, if that's our gift, we're supposed to give that back as if it was our living sacrifice. And then we have teaching. There's a lot of different ways that we can teach. We can teach our own offspring. We can teach those around us. We can teach through example. We can teach through words. Those who exhort, 
those who are good at gifted, gifted at building others up. How many of us have ever been down? How many of us have ever liked that someone gave us a helping hand? That's a gift. How many of us are really bad at giving helping hands in certain situations? You know how I know that? Sometimes my wife tells me, I don't want your help. And I translate that to, eh, probably I'm not very good at helping in this. Sometimes my wife tells me, your kid needs your help. And whatever that help needs to be, she's probably right. So the ability to serve others, the ability to teach others, the ability to spread God's word, the ability for building up others. And then we have he who gives. Can someone who's destitute give? In some ways they can. They can give time. They can give service. They can give advice. I would not take investment in advice from me. But I could help you set up a computer. I've done that with Tim just recently. Wherever Tim is, right there. There's Tim. I wouldn't give building advice, but there are those sitting here that can. There are those that have wealth here. There are those that have no wealth here. There are those that have time here. There are those that have no time. That reminds me. I was going to say this, and now I'm going to. Last year, Keith asked if I would teach the, the teen class. I didn't have time, so I told him no. He remembers this. This year, I came up to him and said, hey, I'd like to teach a teen class. And he said, well, what changed? Well, I don't own a house anymore that's taking all my time. So I got time to do other things. I was, I was loaded last year, but this year, I'm not. So... The other part of this is we could be these things at different stages of our lives. A lot of time when people get to that retirement age, they no longer have the time constraints. So they have a lot more time that they can give. But they're not working, so maybe they're not going to be given as much money out, right? So th the idea here is that you're not locked into one thing that you can do. You can adjust. You can change. And the priority should be, how is my time, energy, money, ability going to be the most fruitful? That's what Paul's getting at. How do we identify what we can do right now? And how do we give that back with our life? This idea is, he who leads then with diligence... So there are those that will be leaders. And leaders can come in a variety of different flavors. The leader that tells everybody else what they're supposed to be doing while not doing it. There was a problem with that in this time. The leadership of Israel was telling the people what they should do and not doing it. And Paul says that's not the right way. If you're a leader, you should do it with diligence. Practice what you preach. Lead by doing, and those who will follow are now following a leader. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. This one's a tough one. Those that ask you for mercy, we need to get to the point where we can show that mercy with cheerfulness. And that usually involves someone that's wronged you. And if they ask for forgiveness, they ask for your mercy, we should be able to get to the point where we can show that mercy with cheerfulness. And again, I'm reminded of Brian's prayer that we, we have bitterness and we have resentment, and that's stuff that we have to get over. We have to be able to show mercy with cheerfulness. Continuing on, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil, cling to what is good. We spoke about love up here frequently, and the next passage, preview of coming attractions, the next passage we talk about is also going to be an, another list of these gifts. 
And at the end of it, Paul says that he's going to show us a more excellent way. And that more excellent way is love. But we're not talking about love today. We're talking about work. We're talking about doing things with our gifts. We're talking about the actual mechanics of how we are supposed to show love, not just the encapsulation of love itself. All of these things, if we don't do it, and I think that's what he was talking about with mercy, showing mercy with cheerfulness. If we are doing these things and we're not doing them from a place of love, it's pointless. So he says, let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Hate what is evil. We talked about that this morning as well in the adult class. The difference between being in the world and of the world. The difference between having a friend that is in the world versus being friend of the world. We are supposed to hate the things that are evil, and we are supposed to cling to those things that are good. Be devoted to one another in brotherly love. Give preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, preserving in tribulation, devoted to prayer, continuing to the needs of the saints, practicing hospitality. So we're done kind of with the list of things you can do with your talents and more into how we're supposed to behave while administering these talents. But at the end here, verse 13, it says, contributing to the needs of the saints. So if you're finding that you don't know what to do, if you're finding that, well, I, I don't know, I don't know how I can contribute because I'm not, I'm not as good at, at this as this other person, or I'm not as good at at this is this other person, so why would I even help? That's, that's kind of summed up right here. It says we're still supposed to contribute to the needs of the saints. So we find a need, and if we're the person that can help with that, we fill the need. And in so doing, we are practicing hospitality. We are practicing this whole chore, this whole calling of doing the work of God with our abilities. And I just noticed this morning that Romans 12, 1 through 13, if you splice it right at verse 13 and you jump to 1 Corinthians 12, 14, we're talking about the same thing, same author. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot says, because I am not a hand, I'm not a part of the body. It is not for this reason any the less a part of the body. So now we're talking about some of the other issues that arise with our humanity. This comparison between what I can offer and what someone else can offer. And Paul's saying, just because you're the foot, or just because you're the guy that, that runs over here to spread the word, or the guy that runs over here to spread the word, and you're not the hand, you're not, you're not able to give, you're not able to do these other things, it doesn't mean you're not part of the body. If the ear says, because I'm not the eye, I'm not part of the body, it is not for this reason any less part of the body. It's still part of the body. Those that hear, those that listen, those that speak, those that walk, those that give, the body needs all of these things. If the whole body were an eye, where would the hearing be? If the whole were hearing, where would the sense of smell be? But now God has placed the members, each one of them, in the body, just as he desired. Again, referencing back to the parable of the talents. We don't get to choose our abilities. We're given these abilities and we're expected to perform with whatever level of those abilities we have. If they were all one member, where would the body be? But now there are many members, but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Or again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, 
and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Every time I read these passages, it, to me, the image in my mind is that of a, a, a rock band or a, a symphony or an orchestra. What happens if in the orchestra they cut off all of the trombones? The flutes say, we don't need the trombones. Or what happens if we cut off all the percussion? What if a, a rock band loses its drummer? What happens if you, you, you lo lose the lead singer? What happens if an orchestra loses the director? Chaos. It's a mess. You don't have a band. You don't have an orchestra. But some of those members may play a more prominent, more flashy role. And what Paul's telling us here is that we can identify that, yes, this is a more flashy role. So we need to encourage those that are less flashy all the more. Those that do work behind the scenes. Those, those that do work that nobody else even is really aware of. Those that are able to help our brothers across the ocean. Those that are a bit able to spend their time doing things that I'm not gifted at. Those that are under the radar. Those are the ones that we need to encourage all the more. On the contrary, it is much truer that the members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. I didn't have the time to speak last year to the, to the team class. I'm glad that a lot of you out here did, because otherwise we'd have a teen class without a teacher, and a lot of coffee would be drank and not many words read. Right, Fernanda? Yeah, right, Fernanda. And the members, and those members of the body which we deem less honorable, on these we bestow more abundant honor, and our less presentable members become much more presentable. Whereas our more presentable members have no need of it, but God has so composed the body, giving more abundant honor to that member which lacked, and that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. If one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are Christ's body, and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, various kinds of tongues. All are not apostles, are they? All are not prophets, are they? All are not teachers, are they? All are not workers of miracles, are they? All do not have gifts of healing, do they? And all do not speak with tongues, do they? All do not interpret, do they? But earnestly desire the greater gifts. There's a lot of different options here. There's a wide array of talents that Paul's listed. And these aren't all of the talents. These are the ones that he came up with. Some of these overlap with what he wrote in Romans 12. How many different types of administrations could there be? How many different types of helps could there be? It says, but earnestly desire the greater gifts. So we're going to jump now back to Matthew 25, and we're going to read the conclusion of the parable of the talent. And I realized that Jesus probably wasn't talking about the United States $5 bill while burying the talent. But this was the free picture that I could find. So that's what we're going with. What is the conclusion of the parable of the talent? For to everyone who has, more shall be given. And he will have an abundance. But the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. So this idea here, who gave these individuals their talent? 
They didn't create their own talent. They didn't give themselves gifts. This isn't like a computer game that you go, yeah, I want 10 on strength and 15 on intelligence and all of these different things that you get to choose your own talents. God gave these talents and said, work with what you have. Hone what you have. Get better at what you have. Everyone who has, more will be given you, and he who he will have an abundance. But from the one who does not have, even what he does have shall be taken away. If you squander the time, if you squander your talent, it will be taken from you and given to, the, to those around that actually did the work. Throw out the worthless slave into outer darkness. In the place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. But when the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered before Him, and He will separate them from one another, as the shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on the left. Then the King will say to those on His right, Come, you who are blessed of My Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you, from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. Naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. How many of these things here in, in these last three verses would be under the heading of helps. In this passage, he's saying, I was these things. There are people that are in this position. There are people that are in this boat. People that are hungry. People that are thirsty. People that are in prison. People that are sick. And he's saying, you came to me. You used your talent. You used the abilities I gave you. And you administered to me. You helped me. And then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? And then when did we see you a stranger and invite you in or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer and say to them, truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these brothers of mine, even to the least of them, you did it to me. So this is a sliding scale. It's the extent, how far we're willing to present our bodies a living sacrifice, how far we're willing to set God as priority number one and his instructions for us to use our abilities. That's the extent that we help those around us. And the king will answer and say the same thing. Truly I say to you, to the extent that you did it to one of these my brothers, even the least of them, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, accursed ones, into the eternal fire which has been prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in, naked, and you did not clothe me sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they themselves also will answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? And on the flip side of this coin, he says, then he will answer saying, truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. So we have to, it is imperative to our salvation, to find out what our talents are, to work those talents to the best of our ability, which if God gave us the ability, do you think he's a good judge of whether or not we're using that ability to its fullest? I think, he's a, I think he's the perfect judge of that and all other things. If we have that gift and we squander it or we don't show it or we don't contribute back 
then the judge will say, because you didn't do it to one of these the least, you did not do it to me. And the reward of that would be eternal punishment. The goal of this really is a reminder to myself that God gave everything to me. He gave me all of the things that I value in my life, and he's promised way better than that if I'm a good steward, if I'm a good servant with the things he's already given me. And I think that that lesson is one that we need to hold forefront in our minds and ask ourselves: am I doing what I'm called to do to the best of my ability? Let's go ahead and close with a song.